you could say the French vision, particularly in Burgundy, but in other places too, is that the role of the winemaker in growing grapes and making wine is to give that particular piece of land a voice. G'day everyone, my name is Mark Makiewicz and welcome to the Thomas More Centre channel. Today it's my pleasure to be interviewing Tim Kirk, the Chief Winemaker at Clonakilla Wines, a winery located in Murrumbateman, just north of Canberra. Tim has been a winemaker for almost 28 years and in 2013 he was awarded the Gourmet Traveller Winemaker of the Year. He is married to Lara with whom he has five children. Tim, welcome to the channel. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So I was wondering, uh, firstly, for those who, who don't know you, if you could tell us a bit about your upbringing, your interests and your family, just to kind of set the scene a bit. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I'm, interestingly, one of six boys. I'm the fourth of six boys. I was, wasn't was born in Australia. I was actually born in Aberystwyth in Wales, where my dad, Dr. John Kirk, who is the founder of Glonakilla, as well as my dad, uh, he was lecturing in biochemistry at the University of Wales in Aberystwyth. That's where I was born. Uh, he was married to my mum, obviously. Um, we lost mum a couple of years ago, but uh, she had met dad in the doctoral program in biochemistry at Cambridge University. So that's where they met and fell in love. Uh, it was interesting because uh, they came from fairly different backgrounds. Mum was from a highly respectable English uh, I suppose you'd say middle upper class English family and my dad is basically an Irish peasant <laughs> and Catholic so uh, Anglican a proud Anglican meets an Irish Catholic in the doctoral program at Cambridge and uh, and I, I just would like to point out in my dad to my dad's great credit I think that the men outnumbered the women in the doctoral program at Cambridge at that point 10 to 1 so and my mum was a stunner. She was a gorgeous English rose, and how this Irish peasant managed to win her heart well, it says says a lot for him, I think. So <laughs> they married, and then uh, they started having kids, and they were all boys, as it turns out. And I was the fourth of them, and born in Aberystwyth, as I mentioned. Uh, and then, of course, later, um, only a year or so later, my dad was contacted by the CSIRO in Australia, which at that point, in its Evolution was a, was a really um, dynamic organization, cutting edge science, uh, very kind of optimistic and forward uh, looking. And they were looking for talented scientists to come and join their various research programs in Australia. So dad was effectively headhunted by the CSIRO and uh, somehow convinced my mum to come along for the great adventure of shifting to the other side of the world. And in 1968, uh, what was then, I was the youngest of four boys and we boarded the good ship, the Aronce, and we sailed over, apparently first class, they tell me, to, <laughs> to settle in Canberra, Australia, where the division of plant industry of the CSIRO was based. And dad took up his research work with CSIRO. And that's how I ended up being an Aussie, which of course is a great blessing. It's just, what a country. What a country, and so grateful to have grown up Australian. Subsequent to my arrival with my family, two other boys were born, Jeremy and Stephen, and uh, so that that was my that was my origin story. What else can I tell you? Well, I'm a Catholic family. Um, that faith has always practiced. The faith has always been part of my um, upbringing. My parents had an ecumenical marriage. My mum never formally joined the Catholic Church, but she used to go to mass with my dad. Um, every Sunday, later in life, the last couple of decades, certainly. Not quite so much when we were younger. Uh, and um, a very musical family. Music has always been part of our family culture. Dad is uh, proficient at a number of instruments, probably violin, fiddle, I think you'd probably better say, because he usually always plays in the Irish kind of style, uh, would be his main instrument. So I grew up in a, in a, in a family where music was just part of our family culture. I guess the other thing I'd say about my upbringing, my origin story, is that it was a fairly intellectual culture. I guess that part flows from having 
both parents with PhDs in biochemistry, but that academic pursuit uh, and interest certainly flowed into our family culture and um, we were encouraged to think. I, I do remember that a lot of our ways of communicate a major way of communicating in some ways was probably argument, rational debate around the dining table, which, you know, had its strengths and weaknesses. The strength would be that it trains you to think. And if you're going to make an argument, you want to be sure you can back it up with a strong mm-hmm. rational line of thought. Um, the weakness is that if your mo- main uh, mode of communication is argument, you maybe become trained to be somewhat less vulnerable to keep your weaknesses hidden and your vulnerabilities hidden and to present with your strengths. So it doesn't always work in our favor, I think. I think Mm. um, there are times when we need to be able to expose our vulnerabilities and know that we're in an environment where that can be received and nurtured, I suppose. So, But look, overall, there's so many things I'm grateful for in my my childhood and my parents and their faithful marriage for such a long time until we lost mum a couple of years back now, uh, such a great witness to me and to all of us, really. Um, so, yeah, uh, the bit we haven't got to, but we're going to talk about in as much more detail as, is wine. So maybe we can deal with that in a subsequent question. But, yeah, Very good. it comes Thanks in pretty early as well. <laughs> so you've spoken a bit about your dad, uh, Dr. John Kirk. Uh, so he founded Quantikiller in 71, I believe, um, planted the vines at least. Uh, so I was wondering, could you tell a bit, a little bit more about his story and how Kleiner Killer as a winery has developed through the decades? Yeah, of course. So my dad is the founder of Kleiner Killer, still with us. He's now 88 years of age. Uh, great man, really a great man. Um, brilliant mind, a great scientist, um, author of a number of scientific books. The most, the best known of them would be the um, the book with a great title, Light and Photosynthesis in Aquatic Ecosystems, which I have been told by other scientists who've come through the wine at different times is the classic work in its field. So if you want to know what light does in water and how that affects plant growth and plant life through photosynthesis, JTO Kirk's Light and Photosynthesis in Aquatic Ecosystems is the required text. <laughs> um but apart from that, he had his scientific work, apart from his scientific successes, he had this lifelong interest in wine. And it started actually in his teen years because his parents were, his mother in particular, my grandmother, quite entrepreneurial. She started off owning in England, kind of mid to North England where they were uh, after the war. She started a clothes shop which I think morphed fairly soon into two clothes shops. And then she decided she wanted to invest in a hotel in Ireland and she bought a fairly significant hotel, a serious hotel in the uh, holiday town of Lisden Varna. Lisden Varna has this great reputation still to this day of being something of a party town. But if you imagine it this way, there was a town there in the south of Ireland, Lisden Varna, where young farmers after the harvest, when they were reasonably cashed up, if you wanted to go and find a wife, Lisden and Varna was the place to be. And the Hydro Hotel was, I think, the major hotel in Lisden and Varna. So, of course, it was a place of lots of life and music and celebration and uh, lots of great Irish <laughs> carry-on. So they ran this hotel, and my dad was at boarding school in England, but he would return in the summer holidays, and his parents... I'm assuming to keep him out of mischief, would put him to work in the dining room. And in a particular way, Dad was given a responsibility for looking after the cellar and serving wine to the guests who came to dine. And in that capacity, he had to deal with the wine salesmen, and they were men in in those days, who would come to visit with their wares. Dad felt if he was going to make the right purchasing decisions, he'd need to learn something about wine. So he bought a text, a very important book, which the name of which just currently escapes me. And he started studying about wine. This is before he had any personal taste for wine. He was like 14 years of age, but he wanted to be ahead of the game with his knowledge of what wine was about and the various great regions in the world of wine, particularly the French region. So we're talking about Bordeaux and Burgundy and the Rhone Valley and Champagne. You need to know a bit about port from Portugal and sherry from Spain. 
So he was reading all about these things and it just captured his imagination. And, it, and, it, and not surprisingly, wine is a really fascinating topic. People have been interested in wine and making wine and growing grapes and fermenting it's fermenting grapes for thousands of years. And it's fascinating. It is. And so he was, his very bright mind was captured by the idea of wine and then went on to, uh, as I mentioned, study at university, went through Cambridge. He did his postdoctoral work at Oxford. And in, in those places too, wine is part of the culture, particularly the culture of the high table. So he got to taste many great wines. So when he got to Australia in 1968 and settled here in the Canberra district, he, he was, I suppose, struck by the idea, why isn't there a, why isn't wine made here? And when he asked that question of his scientific colleagues, they said, well, it's too cold because, you know, fair enough, the Australian, the major Australian model for wine up to that point had been a warmer climate model. So you think the Barossa Valley or the Hunter Valley or the Swan Valley over in Western Australia. But Dad's model was a European one, you see. And to him, and when he looked at the climate studies and the, the diurnal range, the average temperature range between nighttime and daytime temperature, the humidity levels, it, he found lots of similarities to some of the great wine regions, such as Bordeaux, for example. And he thought, well, this seems perfect for me. So to his great credit, he, in 1971, bought a brand new 44-acre um, recent subdivision from a much larger fine wool-growing property here at Murray Bateman and proceeded to plant a vineyard. And it was a small vineyard and we had all the challenges dad faced all the challenges and trials and tribulations that you might expect so we had soon after we planted we went into a couple of years of drought and he lost two-thirds of the vines and then we had to learn about downy mildew when it ranges rains too much in the spring and then powdery mildew when you get kind of too much cloudy humid weather and then if it's once the grapes start to ripen if it if you get rain you can be over, overwhelmed with botrytis so all we had a plague of grasshoppers one year you know all the challenges of growing grapes and uh, learning how to make wine. And he persevered through all of those. And Clonakilla, of course, subsequently has become um, known and celebrated as one of the great Australian wineries, uh, which is, to me, amazing, um, but wonderful and a great credit to Dad and his foresight in having a punt, having a go all those years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you've said that land is able to speak to us through wine. Uh, could you describe the relationship you have with the land on which your winery sits? Oh, look, that's that's a great question, and and it's to some extent it's a, a philosophical question. Now, wine, of course, has this wonderful long history in Europe, uh, and it has a great and glorious history in Europe, thanks to the monks. Actually, the monks are the ones who carried the wine um, craft, let's say, through the Dark Ages, through all of the turbulence of the difficult centuries, um, when so much of Western culture was under threat, uh, the monks protected a lot of it in the, in the knowledge that they retained, in the books that they kept, but even more so in the way they, over the centuries, worked the landscape. So I'm thinking here particularly now because um, I think this is a very good example of the great wine region of Burgundy in France. And there were two major monasteries there. And in Burgundy, they have this remarkable and, to my mind, utterly fascinating uh, stratification of the vineyards. I should go back a step and say that Burgundy, what we call the main section of Burgundy, is this long strip of largely east-facing slopes, which is known as the Cote d'Or, the Golden Slope. And grapes have been grown there for many centuries, maybe well over a thousand years. And the monastics looked after that land for much of that time. And the monks actually discerned over centuries which patch of land, which patches of land would produce the highest quality the almost as good quality, the pretty good quality, and the fairly basic quality. They have four levels, which uh, these days we talk about the Grand Cru vineyards, Premier Cru vineyards, Village vineyards, and then generic Burgundy, Bourgogne. So that was arrived at through careful observation of 
both the landscape itself and the quality of the wine that came from all those different parcels of land, every different section of that extraordinary slope, the Golden Slope, the Code d'Or. And to this day, that kind of idea of the inherent quality in the landscape, which is dependable, it's repeatable year after year, is very important to the um, uh, French wine industry, and particularly the, in, in Burgundy. And they have this idea. They have a word for it. Terroir. Beautiful word. Terroir. Um, similar to where we get like our own terror or relating to the earth, to the land. But it's more than just the earth. The earth, the land itself is very important. So think about this. The complexities of the soil structure. You know, you have all, even in the short space, uh, in any given patch of land, you'll get variations in soil, the depth of topsoil, whether there's a clay layer, what's beneath the clay layer, is there gravel? How does water move through that soil profile? What's the nutrient level? What's the organic content of the soil? Has there been plenty of grass grown over there for centuries, which is now decomposed and given the soil a bit more health and fertility? What's the microbial dimension of the soil? What's going on at the microscopic level? All of those things, all of those amazing complex details will have an impact on the flavors and aerobes and textures that you get from the wine. But it's not just the soil. It's the shape of the slope. How does the slope sit in relation to the way the sun moves through the sky at all the different times of the year, particularly in that growing and the ripening phase from spring through to late summer, early autumn? The shape of the slope, if does it slope slightly to the east, in which case the sun from the moment it rises intersects with the slope and warms the ground. And warm ground, of course, then gives the vine the capacity to start operating. The photosynthesis kicks in. Uh, it picks up the sun early. Or is it slope more towards the west, so it's getting more heat from the afternoon sun? Is most of the ripening in a hotter kind of experience of western sun? All of those elements, the shape of the soil, what's beneath the ground, and then what about the wind direction? What about the rainfall pattern? Yeah, all of those things will have an impact on texture and aroma and flavor as they develop in the mm. grapes as they ripen. Well, and all of that's captured by this magnificent word terroir. So put it in much more simple terms. You could say the French vision, particularly in Burgundy, but in other places too, is that the role of the winemaker in growing grapes and making wine is to give that particular piece of land a voice. That the vines and the wines that are made from the grapes, grown from those vines, are the instrument through which the landscape is given its voice. And it is fascinating. I mean, in Burgundy, it's if it's a red Burgundy, it's almost always Pinot Noir. And so it's the same variety, um, but you taste a, Burgund a Burgundy wine from different parts of that amazing hill, they'll taste quite different. And the difference, of course, is in what's the complex elements written into the landscape. So that's a fairly long-winded answer, but it's a beautiful and I think come kind of romantic vision which we are working with landscape and trying to capture the essence of the landscape and give the landscape a voice to capture the personality of the site, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, and that's a that's a philosophy of wine that I absolutely embrace. That our job, our job, the Clonicular, our winemaking team, and our viticulture team work together to capture the essence of this landscape. And it just turns out that this landscape here, where we are at Murray and Bateman, with our decomposed granitic soils, with our sandy clay, sandy loam clay topsoil with our brown red clays, which sit below the top of soil and, and above the decomposed granite, are just perfect for winemaking. And in particular, for I'd say for Shiraz and Riesling, that when we grow Shiraz in, in this climate, which is the cool climate, we sit at 600 meters above sea level, so we have warm days, cool nights. We have warm summers, cold winters. You grow grapes in this climate, in those soils, on these slopes, you, we produce wines which have such a stunning perfume, a gorgeous red berry, um, floral, violets, roses, full of complex spices that we get in, in, in our vineyards here from the vines we grow here. It's remarkable. It doesn't taste like Shiraz from any other region, really. It has its own unique set of aromas and flavors, which are distinctive um, at, to our environment. 
So I love that idea, Mark, mm. that our job is to capture the essence of the particular of the landscape and to give it a voice, to hear them. It's getting even more romantic now, to hear the, the <laughs> singing, the singing <laughs> of the landscape, the beautiful tone <clears throat> that comes from here, the resonance that comes from here in liquid form, and you can smell it and you can taste it and you can enjoy it. And what a great vision of wine and who wouldn't want to be a wine lover with all of that going into it. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a bit like a marriage of poetry and science. And so it's not just hard edged kind of just analytical thing, but it's also the bringing the music, bringing the, uh, the colors and the l lyricism of the earth and all the rest of it together. Um, so it's very holistic, you know, and, um, I, th oh, I think that must show in the wine, like that, bit, that, that philosophy must come through somehow. Um, yeah, and you add in my case, because, you know, my, my own background is, I'm sure we'll touch on this too, is in theology. My training is in theology, particularly biblical theology. <laughs> and um, I actually have no formal qualifications in winemaking. It's all kind of learned from my dad and learned by traveling in the great wine regions of the world, and learning on the job, learning from my many mistakes. Uh, but um, my training is in theology. So when you overlay that philosophy of wine with an, a concept which is deep in the biblical revelation of the goodness of creation, that the earth exists because God's spoken into being and he said, this is good, this is good. That there's, And I think anyone, whether they're a person of faith or not, can recognize that there is a dignity and a beauty in the, in the world, the physical world around us, particularly in the natural world, which can take our breath away. And to be working with the dignity and beauty of the created world, the natural world, and to try and capture something that's written into that good landscape uh, in a way that people can enjoy it uh, is, is a it's, it's a pretty great thing to be doing yeah there was a there was a verse i saw recently and it was talking about wine was speaking or the vine was itself speaking and it says i cheer god and men and i thought well <laughs> isn't that a great uh, <laughs> a that's great little bad, thing uh, claim the fame <clears throat> there are the vines mm. <laughs> So, uh, in terms of your signature wine, it was your idea to take the white Viognier uh, grape and to ferment it with Shiraz. Um, so that's been a huge success. Uh, presumably, you're still experimenting with wine all the time. But is it now a matter of you're tweaking things, or do you still try kind of radical ideas? It's look. <laughs> I guess I'd say, just going back a little bit on that, the, um, the Shiraz Viognier, that's, that's our flagship wine. That's the one that we're internationally renowned. Oh, yes, correct, so. mm -hmm. And uh, credit again to my dad there because he, actually at the suggestion of my brother Jeremy, my, he, the one immediately younger than me, very smart guys, Jeremy Kirk, and he suggested to dad when he was just like, I think, 13 years of age that we should try something a bit different, a variety that maybe other people hadn't done much with and uh, see if we could maybe make a bit of a point of difference. So dad thought that was wise and he consulted his viticultural texts and thought about our climate and our soils here and found lots of parallels with the Northern Rhone in just south of the great city of Lyon in France, where they, where this region Cote Roti is, where they do this Shiraz Viognier blend. And in, next to Cote Roti, just south of Cote Roti is the um, region of uh, Condrieu, where they grow Viognier, and it's pure white form, um, to make this most intense, gorgeous, aromatic, thickly textured uh, Condrieu. It's quite a quite a wine, quite rare, hard to find, but worth worth tasting. So Dad was captured by this Condrieu idea and thought, well, why don't we try and do a make a grow some Viognier and see if we can make a white wine like a Condrieu or a Viognier. And he managed to source, and it was very rare in Australia, but he managed to source through his collections at Charles Sturt University, where he had um, completed his wine science degree, uh, some cuttings. And in 1986, planted, so nearly 40 years ago now, planted some these tiny Viognier cuttings. And they took ages to, to grow. They were quite weak, feeble little things. And it took twice as long as you would normally expect a vine which would be three years. These took six years to start to look like they were going to set a bit of a crop for us. Mercifully, Dad succeeded. But the miracle was, uh, well, I'll call it a miracle. I, I had gone, Lara, my new bride and I, the year after we married, went for a trip 
a delayed honeymoon of sorts to France and went to visit uh, the Northern Rhone, Condrieu and Cote Roti. And I t- tried not only the Condrieu wines, but I tried these Cote Roti wines, which were a blend of Shiraz and Viognier. So um, they just made such a huge impression on me. Uh, one particular winery, the most successful, the most widely known winery in, in Cote Roti is uh, the Gigal family's wines. And uh, he's got a whole range of Cote Rotis, but the, the pinnacle of these three single vineyard parcels that he makes, La Moulin, La Turc, and La Landon. La Landon, 100% Syrah, which is the French word for Shiraz. Uh, La, La Turc is 7% Viognier, co-fermented with the Syrah, and La Moulin is uh, 10 to 11% Viognier, co-fermented with the Syrah. And I was so blessed to be able to try those wines out of, straight out of barrel, and they basically just pull were stunning for their aromatic intensity, the lifted spices, these gorgeous swirling red fruits and floral perfumes. I just fell in love with those wines. And um, the textures were, were silky but still strong. They had power as well as elegance. And I thought, gosh, that's that's a wine. That's a wine. And I thought, well, look, if ever we could make a wine from our humble vineyards here at Murray Bateman, which approached, got anywhere near the complexity and intensity of perfume and texture in, in these Cote Roti single parcel wines from the Gigal, that would be, that would be amazing. So I came back to the winery in 19, uh, beginning of 1992, where the Viognier that dad had nurtured from these tiny little spindly cuttings that we got up to a vines which were about to crop for the first time, I said to dad, well, why don't we try, instead of making a white Viognier, why don't we try doing what we saw them doing in Cote Roti and ferment them together, put the little bit of the Viognier that we're going to get in with our Shiraz and try the Shiraz Viognier blend. Uh, and that's what we did with the 1992 Clonakilla Shiraz. If you look up at the side of the label in fine print, it says, amongst other things, it says 1% Viognier. Uh, and it got great reviews. People loved it, and we loved it. And so we thought, well, we might be on to something. So we persevered, 93. 94, we got up to 4% Viognier. And then we had a bit of a rush of blood to the head. 95, 96, we went up to 10% Viognier. And the wines were getting a lot of attention because it was a whole fresh new take, if you like, on Australian Shiraz, and um, particularly fermented with some Viognier. So red and a white together. Who would have thought? And... Uh, we basically then settled back into a more regular addition, a co-fermentation of about 5 to 7% Viognier. And um, it became celebrated, as, as we've mentioned, as one of the great Australian reds to our delight and amazement. So we, I guess, feel as a family, we, we've discovered something, we, we've, we've received something. It seems like a gift that... Um, is particular to us and, and a big part of what we do is fine-tuning that great wine. You know, we're always looking for the 1% and 2 and 3% opportunities to make a great wine even better, fine-tuning our viticulture and our winemaking to do a, an even better job, casting back to our previous discussion about receiving uh, the voice of this landscape through that blend, Shiraz Viognier, which just seems perfect here in these soils and in this climate. Okay, so that's the main game, and I think we need to let the main thing be the main thing, and that's the main thing. But, you know, I'd be lying to you if I said we doesn't mean we don't experiment with other things. And one of the things we've been doing in the last decade or two is a blend of wines which would you'd find more in the southern Rhone rather than the northern Rhone. So I'm talking about Grenache, Mouvedre, uh, Sanso, Cunoise, a little bit of Roussan, and as, as well as Shiraz. So we make a wine called the Kiel Toiri, which is an, another good Irish name. This time it means musicians. It's like, you know, members of a band, all the different musicians playing together, playing their own instruments, all these different great varieties, contributing their own thing and making a beautiful harmonious sound as a consequence. So the Kiel Toiri is uh, something we have a lot of fun making. In fact, this is the last thing we picked this this, just this week were some of those Kiltori varieties, Grenache and Mouvedre, Sanso and uh, Roussan. Uh, that's great fun. And uh, we do other things too. We make a little bit of Pinot Noir, which is, I love Pinot Noir, which 
it's the great red variety of Burgundy that I've already mentioned. And we are quietly excited about the quality of Pinot Noir we're seeing too. As well as doing, uh, we do a Cabernet blend, Cab Sav, Cab Franc and Merlot. So a bit of an homage to Bordeaux, which also in, make it small quantities, but it has followers, keen followers. Uh, we make a couple of different varieties of uh, examples of Viognier, a, an unwooded version and a barrel fermented wooded version. And the other white, which really is kicking goals for us, is is Riesling. So, and we're pushing the envelope there too. We've started to make a, as well as our main Riesling, which is delightful, very floral, sort of limey, citrusy, beautiful perfumes, but also a crisp, acidic uh, textural element to the to the palate. Uh, great wine, and they age beautifully. But you know, you think about the great Rieslings of Germany. You think of some of the great sweet wines. Our main Riesling is a pretty dry wine, but we've just started playing the last couple of years with our um, winery manager, Chris, has a great love for the German Rieslings, and we've been making um, some sweet versions like Auschlaser style Rieslings, which are also capturing a lot of interest. So I'm, I'm on a bit of a run here, so you better stop me, Mark, because I'm practicing <laughs> lyrical. But yeah. <laughs> Yes, we are, we are learning as we go and always seeking to improve. But yeah, Shiraz Viognier is the main game, reasoning mm-hmm. along with it maybe. But there's always things that we're working on. Uh-huh. Um, so in addition to being a winemaker, you're also a devoted Christian. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the Disciples of Jesus community that you belong to? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm very proud and out, I suppose, as a Christian, as a Catholic Christian, um, raised Catholic. And uh, then in my mid to late teens, I went through an experience of um, personal conversion, I suppose, where I, you know, and I think this is really important to say that I, I went through a journey by which I decided to own for myself the, the faith of my forebears. And particularly as a Catholic Christian, I, I started to take my faith much more seriously and follow the person of Jesus in a very personal and a committed way and wanting that to be the main value and principle that uh, guided my life and the way I was to live my life. Uh, And that led me to a uh, community of of like-minded Catholic Christians who had come to a deep experience of faith through the charismatic movement within the church, um, which had been my journey. And uh, that that community now has the name Disciples of Jesus. And it's very just simply a, a group of very committed Catholic Christians who are committed, obviously, to their faith. And, and we make a commitment to each other. We involve, it involves like meeting together at the top of our, our standard Catholic endeavors of being part of Catholic parishes, which we are happily. We have ad, added things that we do, like prayer meetings, praise and worship services. Um, we have sharing groups, smaller groups. We have home fellowship nights, um, which are a lot of fun, involving you know food, often food and wine and celebration and friendship and all those good cultural experiences. Um, we have, on top of the things that we do together as kind of a community lifestyle, uh, supporting, mutually supportive lifestyle, we run um, outreaches. So we do a lot in youth ministry, for example. We run here in Canberra. In this branch of our community, we run a really successful youth group called Fusion, which is for year seven to 12 students. It's held once every two weeks. We get 40 or 50 young people coming along to that, and that's fantastic. A lot of fun, um, life-affirming, faith-affirming environment. We also run what we could call uh, evangelizing events. So um, we run a summer school in a couple of different places around the country every year. She goes for a week, again, aimed mainly at a, a younger audience, 16 to 30 year olds. And the big thing that we've just finished, actually, and I'm still um, buzzing from, is um, our biannual or biennial, which is, I never remember which one's which, every two years we run over the Easter weekend. Uh, There's a great event called Light to the Nations, which is a uh, a full celebration of the Easter liturgies in the Catholic tradition. Um, so it's kind of very much a, a Catholic celebration. It, um, the Holy Thursday, Eucharist, then the Good Friday services, and then the big event, which I love so much, is the uh, Easter Vigil Mass on Saturday night. And we do it all 
in a tent. We have a large um, marquee and we had like something like a thousand people there, Mark. It was um, it was a great experience, very, very Catholic, but also done in a charismatic style. So, you know, the music is warm and rich. We have two music bands, if you like. We have a more contemporary style praise and worship kind of band. And then under the direction of my brother, Stephen, who's a very gifted uh, liturgist, we have um, uh, more... Uh, more liturgical oriented band and then under the direction of Michael Last, one of the missionaries of God's love, a fabulous choir made up of community members from all around the country. And uh, the music was just off chops. It was awesome. Um, so both in the modern style for the praise and worship sessions in, in often in non-liturgical settings and then in the liturgical style, um, some really beautiful, rich music drawing both from contemporary and ancient sources. Uh, just a wonderful celebration of Easter and, uh, uh, and a great one of the things about our community, and I don't know how how much we want to go into this, but we have it's a it's basically a lay community, but we have within our community we have um, what is effectively a new religious order called the Missionaries of God's Love. This is remarkable and very rare to see in the church anywhere, a lay community with a religious order within it. Missionaries of God's Love, we have priests. We have well over 30 priests now. We have brothers and we have sisters, Missionaries of God's Love sisters. And they work hand in hand with people like myself, lay leaders like myself. So I'm currently the leader of the Canberra branch of the community, Disciples of Jesus. I was formerly the international leader of Disciples of Jesus. Uh, and it's exciting to have kind of um, clergy, religious sisters and brothers working hand in hand with lay people, men and women, um, in a very dynamic kind of approach to ministry and to, to life, which is so uh, life-giving and um, both for us as a community, but we sort of feeds into the life of the church more generally. And we, we exist, we say, because we want to bring life to the church and life to the world. We want to be an evangelizing, life-giving, um, love of God-sharing community. So that's, um, that's a huge part of my life. I'll, yes, it's true and uh, something I'm very grateful to have. Hmm. So you would be very familiar with the wedding at Cana episode described in uh, John chapter 2 uh, mm. as a winemaker. I was wondering, is there any particular detail in that episode which catches your attention? Oh, so many. That's a great text. That's with all uh, texts. But in a particular way, with John's gospel, there's always a number of layers Um so what can we say? The, the role of Mary is, is the mother of Jesus is something I love. He is a woman of great um, compassion and discernment. There's a young couple at their wedding feast, which is the biggest, you know, culturally a huge moment in their lives. And uh, Mary becomes aware that they're running out of wine and face um, significant humiliation. So she uh, lays it on her son. Uh, to do something about it. But this is before his public ministry has started and uh, he seems to express some reluctance. <laughs> but Mary doesn't debate the matter with him. She just says to the servants around the place, "Do that guy, my son, do whatever he tells you. So, And he tells them, you know, everyone knows the story, I'm sure, to get these large stone water jars, and they were large and filled them with water, which wouldn't have been a small job if you think about it. They didn't have running water. They had to find the water from somewhere and fill these large water jars. And then, of course, the great miracle is that Jesus uh, turns the water into wine, but not just any wine. I love this detail of the story too. The, the steward who's given the wine to taste is blown away by the quality of the wine and says to uh, the master of the feast, you know, most people serve the good wine first and then the the less good wine later when everyone's had plenty to drink and won't know the difference anyway, but you've kept the best light wine until last. You've kept the best wine until now, he says. Uh, I love that because when mm. you see that word now, like that's, uh, it's like an eternal now that God has kept the best wine until now because <clears throat> Jesus, well, what has happened in the person and through the life and ministry of the person of Jesus <coughs> is the best wine. It's mm. the release of uh, the outpouring of the love of God. And that's exemplified 
by the abundance. I mean, these stone jars, you know, probably held something like 150 to 200 litres each. And I, I can't remember precisely how many there were, but there were a number. So it was a huge amount of wine, a huge amount of absolutely gobstoppingly beautiful, stunning wine. And this, of course, um, apart from the miracle for that young couple, is uh, on the deeper level of the narrative, the sign value of that is that in the presence of Jesus, with the, with the coming of Jesus, the wine that's been poured out is super abundant and super good. Uh, I, love, I love that detail to mm. the abundance of the goodness of God poured out for us as demonstrated figuratively through this image of wine. What a great mm. image. Yeah. Yeah, I've, uh, I've read that alongside uh, the crucifixion episode and there seem to be a number of parallels. And the, the wine that Jesus makes mm. is also paralleled with the sour wine at the foot of the cross. But that's the poor wine. It's interesting. He, it, he, he delivers this great wine to the, the people at the wedding feast, but himself when he's consuming it, he's drinking the soldier's drink, Posca, which is this diluted mm. vinegar, vinegary stuff. Um, wow. And uh, and so it's just another example of him giving the best of all his his best to us, and then in in response, all we can almost offer is is this mediocre uh, drink. But um, yes, 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 and then of course, <clears throat> Mark, you know the story doesn't end there because of course Jesus is crucified, uh, dies a terrible, painful death, like the worst death that the Romans, in their capacity for cruelty, could devise. Uh, and in the Christian understanding, of course, he does that out of love as a sacrifice mm. to take away the brokenness and the wounds and the sins of the world. Um, he takes it with him into his death and ends the power of sin and darkness and hate, he ends it in his own body, takes it into himself and dies. And then as you know, Christians believe that God raised him from the dead. And then having raised him from the dead, raised him all the way to the right hand of the Father in the ascension. And from there, in Luke's theology, of course, he receives from the Father the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is poured out upon the church at Pentecost, which we call the birth of the church, is this outpouring of the Spirit. And uh, it has a dramatic effect on the disciples. Mary's there gathered with, we're told, over 120 disciples, and the effect of the outpouring of the Spirit is dramatic. And I love this detail, of course, that the bystanders said, or they were heard to comment, it's, these people are drunk. They're drunk with new wine. And while it was intended to be um, a mockery, I suppose, of the apparently very significant impact of the Holy Spirit, being poured into the lives, the hearts, the minds, the bodies of these disciples. Uh, it was meant to be mockery, but it was actually entirely accurate. Mm -hmm. They were. They were they were being filled with the new wine, the new wine of the Spirit, the new wine, the outpoured love of God. The Spirit is inebriating. Like, it's extraordinary. It releases um, immense power. Uh, and confidence, as we can see, that we got Peter and the disciples who up to that point had locked themselves in the upper room, terrified with good reason of the Roman authorities and the, and the Jewish authorities who had organized the crucifixion of Jesus just weeks before. All of a sudden, they bust open the doors. They go out to the streets of Jerusalem and they start proclaiming loudly, confidently, boldly, with joy and craziness and, and apparent drunkenness, the goodness of God and the who, who in Jesus of Nazareth had, um, you know, brought about our salvation. So yeah. the new wine of the Holy Spirit is also a great interest of mine, um, mm -hmm. as you can expect. My love of wine and my love of God, they come together beautifully in the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, which, of course, in that new wine hasn't stopped flowing through the last mm -hmm. 20 centuries, through the ups and downs and ins and outs and of the tradition and history of the church, the, the wine of the Spirit has never left us. And no. I, I, as I've confessed already, I'm a charismatic Catholic, so I, I, <laughs> I love this concept of experiencing the flow of God, the joyful outpouring of the new wine, and uh, even 
people think charismatics can be a bit crazy and it's possibly true. Uh, and it was certainly true in the first century that when the Holy Spirit fills your life, uh, sometimes things can go a bit interesting. Mm. It's certainly been true in my case. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so, so according to one, <laughs> go on. according to one yeah. count, there are over 140 references to wine in the Bible. Uh, besides, I guess, uh, John chapter two, I was wondering, are there any favorites of yours in there? Well, of course, that Acts text in Acts chapter two and following is is clearly a favourite. Um, oh, which psalm is it now? I've, it's, I've forgotten. Your love is better than wine. Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. Your love is better than wine. Song of songs. Must be pretty good. That must mm -hmm. be pretty good. Yeah. No, that's a psalm. It's not song of songs. Oh, right. they did. Wine <clears throat> which does turn up in song of songs as well. Um. Uh, and obviously, you know, we have um, uh, this extraordinary truth that Jesus chooses wine as the um, symbol which becomes so much more than a symbol uh, in, in giving us the Eucharist, which, of course, then he says, this is my blood. This, uh, this is my very life. This is my blood. Um, so Catholics take a very high view, as you know, of the... Um, of the of the Eucharist and the bread and the wine, actually, we believe do become extraordinarily, miraculously, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the body and blood of Jesus. So Jesus chose bread and wine, both fermented realities. We could talk about fermentation too. Um, though, of course, bread in, in the Eucharistic context is unleavened <laughs> bread because it was in the context of a Passover feast. But anyway, I'm getting distracted, but yeah. <laughs> You, well, Eucharist I can see. I can. I heard you're uh, into bread making now, so I can see. <laughs> I can see the interest. <laughs> yeah, I, I am a sourdough fiend, like so many others. But um, yeah, but that's powerful. That's powerful. Um, many other texts as well. I mean, Saint Paul, in the letter to the Ephesians, I think it's chapter five, says, "Do not get drunk with wine." That's simply um, dissipation. But he doesn't say don't drink wine. He just says don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Again, harking back to that Acts chapter 2 image, um, the, the new wine poured out, the inebriation, as St. Augustine refers to, the uh, sober intoxication of the Spirit. Uh, I think um, he may, that may not have been original to Augustine. He might have lifted that from uh, someone else. But that, that the sober intoxication of the Spirit, so... Uh, yeah, both in the biblical text tradition and, and then through the, the church fathers, the image of wine um, for the goodness and the flow of the love of God, which impacts us, is, uh, is wonderful. And it's a doctoral thesis waiting to be written, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll do that one day. Who knows when I'm <laughs> retired. Well, possibly. Yeah. Well, you, you've just touched on uh, a question I was wanting to ask, which is, uh, in terms of created matter, wine is right up there. So it, it was it was used in libations by the Jews. It, it's used in the Eucharist by Christians. Um, why do you think God gave it such an important role in the liturgy? This might be a tough question, but I thought you of anyone you might <laughs> have an have an answer. Oh, good question. Um, well. We can answer it by looking at bread. Bread, staff of life, you know, all cultures, pretty much, well, not about all cultures, so many cultures, certainly in the West, have, have, have discovered bread. That you take bread, you take wheat, and you grind it, and you mix it with water, and it will ferment. There's a transformation that goes on. Um, it's such a basic and fundamental source of nourishment. And I suppose wine is its logical parallel. Wine, you take grapes and squash them. Don't do anything else, it'll ferment. There's, there's yeast all around us in the environment. There's yeast on the grapes themselves, on the vines themselves. And it's like a natural miracle that occurs. Um, and for, for thousands of years, in all sorts of different cultures, uh, wine, fermented grape juice has been a safe beverage because, of course, the alcohol in the wine has a certain antibacterial uh, capacity which makes it a, a safe wine to drink, which in some in some places where the water is not safe. So um, it's basically just, uh, certainly in Jewish culture, 
wine was the beverage, the table beverage. And I, and I still, of course, want to insist that wine is the, the, the table beverage of civilized society. I, I still believe that. So maybe because it was everywhere and it was um, celebrated and it had this power that Jesus chose and it was part of the, the Jewish um, systems of, of meals around feast times and particularly the Passover meal. There were a number of moments in the Passover meal where, where the cup was raised. I think actually four times there was a blessing over the cup. So it was to hand, it's deep in the Jewish culture, it's, it's deep in human experience. Uh, it's such a powerful symbol which in this case becomes more than a symbol jesus chooses that as the means through which he um, he puts himself into it he puts his life into the blood his blood into the in, into the wine and says this is my blood and um, as we've said that is so important to to christians particularly those who with who work within the sacramental <coughs> tradition like catholics uh, do and orthodox do and Others, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but uh, hmm. good choice, Jesus, really good. What a, <laughs> what a great thing to use. Hmm. Yeah, just a, a, probably a curveball to that is sometimes wine in the, in the well, perhaps the Old Testament, definitely the New Testament, Revelation, they talk about the cup of wrath, and presumably that's unmixed. They talk about unmixed wine. Um, do, you, do you understand the significance of of unmixed wine and and kind of bad things happening. I don't know. Do you, do you, I, I'm not sure. Do you think that might be an early reference to Shiraz Viognier? That if you don't mix Shiraz and Viognier <laughs> together, things are going to go cook for you. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> Only drink mixed wine, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Drink Shiraz Viognier. <laughs> really, that's what the yeah. conclusion. Beyond that, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so your father, he named the winery Clonakilla after his grandfather's farm in uh, County Clare, Ireland. And also uh, I've seen that your logo is, oh, and, and that means Cl uh, Meadow of the Church, right? Yeah. And the logo of Clonakilla is taken from the Book of Durrow, which is an illuminated manuscript containing the four Gospels. So I was wondering, hmm. are these primarily nods to the, your family's Irish heritage or is it a conscious attempt of trying to bring winemaking and faith together? Look, uh, I would say, I should ask Dad this question, but I think it is primarily a nod to the Irish heritage. The um, Book of Dara, as you mentioned, and illuminated manuscripts, the, the, the monks, and so from the, from the 600s, the 7th century, the monks would copy out the Gospels by hand. It was a very detailed and arduous task. And um, But the Celtic monks, the Irish monks in particular, would... Um, Sometimes the margins or the, the title page before at the start of a gospel, they would use the skills um, with drawing to come up with these gorgeous, gorgeous um, Celtic, I guess we could call them doodles, but they're wonderful and they're very distinctive. And, and of course, the Book of Kells is the most famous example. It's got so much beautiful, beautiful creative work done by the monks. Darrow, less well-known, but still very significant. Of the four Gospels and the start of each Gospel, there's a page where, with the symbols and the designs, and um, Dad chose one of these symbols and used it for the label, which I think again was a stroke of some genius by my dad. And because um, the thing about it, and let's this is from the, you know, what do you call it, sublime to the ridiculous, from a marketing point of view. What do you want your wine label to be? Distinctive. You want your label to be instantly recognizable. That if you're sitting at a table in a restaurant and you look over to a table on the other side of the restaurant and they've got a bottle on the table, you should be able to know at a glance what it is. And I put it to you, the clonical label will do that. It's such a distinctive um, Celtic feature on our label. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dad, he chose it because it was a beautiful image, I'm pretty sure. But it, it's certainly rich. It comes from a gospel manuscript. It's rich in religious um, resonance. Mm -hmm. And even the symbol itself, even the symbol itself, here we go. There we go. It's back to front probably, but there we are. Yeah, it shows uh, right. It's, it's, is it? Okay, yep, look at yep, that. The circles within there. circles. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. See, the circles within circles. So you've got three in one, and those two images on either side, right and left, three in one. And I don't know for sure, but that's sort of got a bit of a Trinitarian vibe. It <laughs> definitely <laughs> does, yeah. Maybe the monk doodling that, that day has had the <clears throat> Trinity on his mind. But mm. apart from that, it's so Irish and so distinctive and so lovely. Mm. That and it's recognizable, and I'm just so thrilled that dad had the foresight to choose that symbol for our label. Yeah, do you know where the book of Darrow is located? Is it is it in you know, I uh, believe it's I, be, I'm not, I stand to be corrected, but I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's in Trinity College in Dublin. I mm-hmm. know I think that's where Kells is at least, I think that's where Darrow is, but one of our uh, viewers may have a better knowledge yeah. than me on that front. So you've noted that uh, meals were key to the evangelical evangelical success of early Christianity, uh, and presumably they remain important today. Uh, so I was wondering, do you think it's like a key or the key to the success of the Alpha course that some people are familiar with? Uh, and do you have any ideas about how meals might be incorporated into any like present day evangelical endeavours? Uh, this is a great question, one I'm very interested in. The um, Alpha Course is a great example of a uh, a program well put together which takes people on a journey of faith. Basically, it's open to anyone who, at any level of faith, from non-faith to practicing Christian, um, to come and do the Alpha Course. Um, and it takes you step by step through the, the, the Christian vision of the world and, and the Christian understanding of um, salvation. Uh, right to the point of the experience of the spirit and his gifts and becoming a, a witness of love and light in the world ourselves. So it's, it was a terrific course. Um, I've been involved in running a number of Alpha courses. And as you point out, key to the Alpha course is that it starts with a meal. Uh, whether that's the most important element, I'm not sure, but it's definitely an impo- one important element of the success of the Alpha course. And I think rightly so. I think... Um, to eat together is profoundly human. Uh, so much of what's good in that happens in human relationships happens around uh, a dining table. Um, so much of what's good that happens in families is around the dining table, you know, and it's something that Lara and I have always been strong on, it, that we don't have devices at the table, we don't watch television, We, if you're dining together, you're eating together, you, you're doing it, you're, you're communing. It's It's terrific, you know. We don't just eat, we dine. We commune together, we share life together, we share food together. Very human, very powerful, uh, very good. Um, so I do think, in fact, that if, you know, as, as, as a Christian people, as a practicing Christian, uh, if I want to share that value of love for God and the person of Jesus and and what he means to me, um, uh, there's no better place in a way to to share that experience than in that human community, that warm human communion of uh, the dining table. And this is not an original idea to me. Jesus employed this all the time. There's so many great uh, references in the, in the Gospels to Jesus dining. And interestingly, Jesus dined with uh, his friends there's you know like we just had the reading at mass a point of recording it was today's gospel about um, Jesus having been raised from the dead cooks a breakfast on the shore of the sea of Galilee uh, for the disciples who they're out in the boat fishing they they kind of get a bit of an idea that that might be him and Peter jumps into the water and gets to Jesus and they come back with this extraordinary haul of fish and Jesus is cooking fish for them. Uh, So they dine, they eat together. They encounter the risen Lord in the context of breakfast. How cool. Uh, So Jesus eats with his friends. He also eats um, with his uh, enemies of sorts. So that's probably a bit simple, but there are a a couple of Pharisees. I think of Simon the Pharisee in Luke chapter 7 who invites Jesus to dinner and more power to you, Simon the Pharisee. I think Simon was genuinely curious. Um, Sometimes the Pharisees get a bit of a bad rap in the Gospels. I mean, they weren't wicked people. They wanted to do well for God and by God, and uh, they they had a vision of the way to do that was to be 
as pure as possible and strict as possible in keeping all the details of the Torah, the law. Uh, there's over 600 different prescriptions in the Torah and they did their best to keep them. Uh, the problem was that they became legalistic about it and then, uh, as uh, can happen with religious people, they became judgmental of others who weren't quite as good at living that level of discipline as they were. Uh, so they and Jesus ran into difficulties, the Pharisees and Jesus. Jesus was uh, less legalistic. But Simon the Pharisee, to his credit, invites Jesus to dinner. Uh, and he, so Jesus dines on a couple of occasions in the Gospels with the Pharisees. Hmm. Great. He also dines with prostitutes, tax collectors, and all manner of other kind of sinners, uh, which is something which really upset the Pharisees because, you see, you risk defilement. If you go and dine with a defiled person, a prostitute, for example, or a tax collector who's working for the Romans, uh, ripping off his own people, then you are defiled. So what are you doing, Jesus? Jesus ate with those sort of people as well, and they loved eating with him. They sought him out, and he sought them out. And so much of Jesus' best work, if you like, was done around the dining table. So if it's good enough for Jesus, I'm saying it should be good enough for us. We should have a ministry of hospitality and Christian families. This is something absolutely that we can do. We invite people in, into the warmth of our table fellowship, our home, our family environment. Um, it'll bless them. It'll be good for them. It'll be encouraging. People will just love, you know, being welcomed into a, a functional enough family where there's love and warmth and good food, it is in itself um, evangelizing, it's gospelizing, it's bringing people closer to the truth of God and his love and his goodness, uh, which is exactly what we're supposed to be doing as Christians, is sharing that with others. Mm -hmm. All right. I've, uh, I thought it would be interesting to see uh, what your greatest wine making tragedy has been as well as what your greatest wine making wine making success has been as well as uh, how uh or have you been able to see god's hand in those moments oh that's a, that's a big question let's think well you know we made plenty of mistakes <laughs> speaking of viognier this very precious rare white variety that we we're working with uh, in the early days, it was the 1995 vintage, I remember, we just had, we'd, we'd got the Viognier and we'd fermented some with the Shiraz to make the Shiraz Viognier, and we had a little bit of white fruit left over. Um, not enough to fill a whole barrel, but um, I had some in a glass demijohn. It's like a 50-litre big glass bottle. And it was, I had two of them, and um, I thought, I'll just move that one there because it's slightly in the way. So I, it was full of fermenting Viognier, very precious, very rare, and I just started to move it. And the, the glass cracked in my hands and precious Viognier started pouring out all over the concrete floor. Mm. That was a bad moment. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, gosh, there's been a few things like that over time. Like um, <clears throat> there's plenty of mistakes you can make in a winery. You tip, tip a... a a bin of grapes the wrong way and they end up all over the floor or you tip some wine or you, um, or, or a valve is left open or you, you're filling a tank and you forget that you've closed, you haven't closed the sample tap and you think you're filling the tank and you find there's water, there's wine pouring out of the sample tap all over the ground. So there's those sort of catastrophes that can happen um, and certainly, uh, look, and look, you do, you learn from your mistakes and I, I, I think that's key. Um, um, you learn like from the things that you didn't get quite right the previous year, like maybe you used too much new oak or not enough new oak, or you, maybe you didn't use enough sulfur dioxide and the wine's a bit flatter than it should be. It's not as bright as it should be or um, all those sort of things. So there's plenty of mistakes, uh, but as they say, the only mistake you make is the one you don't learn from. Um, mm -hmm. That's key. Successes, there's been so many of those. I, I think I would want to say, harking back to our earlier conversation about terroir and the landscape, is this beautiful moment, you know? Like when I finish this interview now, I'll go. I'll go into the winery because um, I've, I've been up in Sydney the last few days. But the winery team and the direction of our winery manager, uh, Chris Bruno, have been putting um, the wines that we've been making, fermenting, 
finish the fermentations, they've been pressed and the wine has been pumped into barrels. And that's a golden moment where I go and I'm going to go and taste those wines, some of them for the first time as, as once they're out of their ferment, fermentation space, the, the wine's been separated from the skins in terms of the red wine. And um, they're in barrels, they're clarifying, they're settling, and I'm going to taste them. And it'll be the first kind of um, comprehensive taste of the vintage to see what this season's given us. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's a magic moment. That's a glorious moment. To, to, to and, and, and I've already, because I've been tasting them as they're fermenting, I know, I know that they're very good. This year, 2024, with the, we had the right amount of rain and we had plenty of warm weather. The grapes were fully ripe. There was not no disease. Uh, we did have frost earlier in the season, which has reduced our yield, unfortunately. But the wines we did make are of very high standard. And I uh, can't wait to taste them all. And in, a little bit further down the track to share them with our devoted customers. Mm-hmm. All right. So I think uh, by now there will be some viewers who will be motivated to go and buy some wine. Uh, I was hoping you could recommend uh, a bottle of Glanakilla, which they uh, might go for, uh, and also after that, like a widely available bottle from another winery, which you've taken a fancy to. Oh, of course. Well, we make wines at Glanakilla at an, um, different levels and different price points, and we do that quite purposefully. So we make a red wine uh, from the neighbouring region, which is the Hilltops district centred around the town of Young in New South Wales. We buy fruit. We don't own vineyards up there. We have long-standing relationship with grape growers. We source fruit from them and we make a, a hilltop Shiraz, which you can pick pick up in that sort of thirty to forty dollar price range, um, and that is very good value for money. Really good wine. But we make because it's not limited to our own vineyard site. We can make quite a lot of it from the grapes that we buy in, and therefore we can keep the price moderate. Uh, the one next up from that is our Arrieta de Shiraz, which is I reckon, bang for buck, very hard to go past because it's a blend of grapes that we've bought from other Canberra district growers, uh, a couple in Murrum Bateman and one near Hall, and then also wine that we've made from our estate vineyards, which otherwise would have been Shiraz Viognier. It's been made as Shiraz Viognier, but we, through our careful selection process through the year, We will taste all the different parcels of Shiraz Viognier that we make from all the different parts of our vineyard here at Murrum Bateman. We keep the parcels separate. There could be over 20 of them in any given year, different vineyard sections, different clones, different rootstocks, different parts of the hill. Keep them all separate. We ferment them separately. They go into barrels separately. Then we will, me and my team, winery team, will taste them and over the course of 12 months discern which are the very best parcels. The very best parcels go into the top wine, the Shiraz Viognier. The ones which are not the very best, but they could be very close to being, they're very good, they will go into the second one, which is the Arrieta Shiraz, named after the great Irish composer, um, celebrator of Irish culture, 1950s and 60s, Sean Arrieta, who happens to be my dad's cousin, he named it after him. So the Arrieta Shiraz, which is a blend of fruit from other Canberra vineyards and declassified Shiraz Fione, great value for money. Then the top, if you want to go all the way to the top, uh, there's two wines. There's the Shiraz Viognier, and then there's a much smaller amount made of a wine called the Syrah, which is the French word for Shiraz, which is from one particular spot on our vineyard here, which is a pure Shiraz. No Viognier in that one. So the Shiraz Viognier and the Syrah, they both sit around in the $120 to $140 range. You really owe it to yourself to try that wine. That's the very best wine we can produce. One of either of those two wines, try both of them at some point. And they're not cheap, but they are the best we can do. Very beautiful. And that's the one we are internationally famous for. Uh, now, in terms of a wine, otherwise, there's so many. And of course, I have so many friends in the wine industry, so many great, passionate wine producers around this country. Uh, I love so many. I, I love the Pinot Noirs from uh, Mornington Peninsula, from the Maston region, from the Yarra Valley, Chardonnays from the Yarra Valley, Chardonnays from Margaret River, Cabernet blends from Margaret River. I love Shiraz from the Hunter Valley. I love some of the great Barossa Shirazes, Clarin Vale Shirazes. I love the Cool Climate Shirazes in Victoria, Tasmanian Pinot and Chardonnay. I don't know. What, what do I do? What do I name? Coonawarra Cabernet. Let's go there because there's, um, there's one red wine from Coonawarra which I reckon is still affordable, 
uh, and really deserves its place in every Australian cellar. That would be the Winds Black Label Cabernet, made by the Winds Winemaking Team, which is led by great winemaker Sue Hodder, great woman of wine in this country. That wine, bang for your buck, very hard to go past a Winds Black Label Cabernet. I mean, there's so many others I could name. I have so many friends in the industry. But uh, that's a more affordable one, maybe, that has a very high quality level. Mm -hmm. How about that? Very good. All right, Tim Kirk, thank you very much for this enjoyable conversation. All the best with the tasting of the new wine. Thanks, Mark. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me. And Easter blessings to you and your family and all our viewers. <laughs> Thank you.